or won't with these things. So uh, absolutely delighted to kick us off here. Uh, people still joining. So I will do a little bit of preamble to give some people to catch up uh, time in terms of joining the webinar. But um, I, I do want to just introduce myself very briefly. Uh, for many of you know me, I'm Michael Diamond, the Academic Director of the Integrated Marketing and Communications uh, programs here at the Division of Programs in Business at the School of Professional Studies at NYU. And I'm actually delighted uh, for this um, event, this, this conversation to be joined by my colleagues in the PR League, the student-run PR League, uh, Felicia, Vicky, and Kimberly, uh, who have helped us organize today uh, gathered some questions from students uh, and encouraged folks to join. So I really want to shout out to them uh, and their efforts um, and their faculty advisors, Shanice Hawkins and Alan Mogul, who this semester particularly have brought an incredible range of new and diverse voices to, uh, to our community. So uh, my thanks to the uh, support of the PR League as well in, in pulling things together today. Um, so without further ado, I wanted to introduce our speaker today. Uh, it's Catherine Metcalf. Um, Catherine uh, was the Chief Communications Officer and Head of Corporate Affairs for uh, Bristol Myers Squibb. Um, and so uh, we hope to sort of explore some interesting things, uh, conversations in the topics of healthcare, et cetera. She, she came from CVS. CVS, as many of you knew, had bought Aetna, where she had been the Chief Communications Officer as well. Uh, and had a very distinguished career leading a communications efforts um, in, in places like Deloitte, et cetera. She's also, uh, we're proud to say, uh, a, a, a faculty alumni of ours, if such a thing exists, and was um, an instructor in our uh, masters in PR and corporate communication. So absolutely delighted to welcome Catherine to this, this conversation. Thrilled um, to be Kath here. Catherine, I, I thought I'd sort of kick off. Um, you know, I'm always intrigued by um, you know, sort of uh, the, 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 the foundation myths, you know, like how we got going and started in our, in our professional careers. And, and so I, I would love to ask you that, you know, simple question, which is, um, you know, uh, what got you started and, and, and how did you get to be, become a chief communications officer? How does one get to become a chief communications officer? <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll try to make this story um, as brief as possible, but I'll start by saying I never really ever aspired to be a chief communications officer. Um, I'll take you uh, back to um, the, the very beginning. Um, my uh, parents divorced and I moved school districts uh, when I was um, impressionable and in junior high school. Uh, enrolling in the new school, I was told I had the choice of electives. I could take journalism, journalism, or journalism. Uh, so I um, took the class and discovered I really loved um, the writing. I, I loved being in the middle of whatever was happening. And it's, you know, a, a passion of mine that has really brought me to where I am today. Um, I uh, studied at Northwestern University. Um, I did a combined um, master's and bachelor's uh, program, um, primarily because I knew my parents couldn't afford a graduate degree <laughs> and I'd never get it otherwise. Um, and I really intended to um, start a, a career as a working journalist. Uh, life had other plans. Um, I met um, Prince Charming uh, who uh, ended up moving to New York. Um, and at the time, New York is where you ended uh, a journalism career, not really where you started one. Uh, I also learned that it was incredibly expensive to live in New York. Um, if you didn't have a full-time job, I literally answered uh, a help wanted ad in the New York Times uh, for a PR firm. Um, and I had a real epiphany, which was I had spent all this time and focus and effort and energy on uh, writing stories. And if you worked in, in PR and communications, you got to create the story. And it was a hell of a lot more exciting and interesting and fun for me to create stories than wait for them to happen and, and write them. So I uh, spent the first half of my career working on the agency side. Uh, was recruited to a client, uh, Novartis, um, and have spent uh, the 
last uh, decade uh, or so on the corporate side with some leading brands uh, doing some incredible things. But it's it's not a, a path that I would say I mapped out and carefully followed a plan for. I would say I am where I am today because I was open to opportunities. Um, because I really intellectually, you know, was drawn to challenges, um, and because I, I really have a passion for what I do. I, well, I, I love the story. I, I'm not sure I, I knew the full story. Is that we have our own Netflix miniseries here? It's like uh, Carrie Bradshaw, <laughs> Emily Post, uh, uh, the intellectual version of it all. That, that's a wonderful. Um, that's a wonderful story. And there's a Prince Charming in there as well. So, yeah, no, I, there you go. I, I've been married to Prince Charming, by the way, for 30 years. Well, that, that's a very important story to tell. So uh, congratulations to, to you on that, uh, at the very least. Um, so, you know, I think you also highlight this interesting relationship between journalism uh, and, and, and uh, PR and, and, and arguably the centrality of writing, perhaps, uh, historically at least, to PR. So I, I guess my question, you know, and we've talked a bit about this in the past, perhaps with a certain nostalgia, uh, you know, about the history of PR and, and some of the, uh, the sort of leaders we saw, uh, you know, folks who were ready to mentor, ready to speak out on issues. What, what, what do you think, to the extent that the industry has changed, and perhaps you could map some of that for us, but you know, what, what do you think might be driving the change? Or what, what, what are the big things that are different now than what you saw when you first entered the profession? Yeah, the single uh, biggest changes are, are all really related to technology and the ability to connect with your audiences in different ways. Things have always moved quickly in communications. The speed at which you have to react um, and get in front of things is, is unbelievable now. I mean, it's a fully 24-7 you know, job with social media. So when I think about you know, how my job and my role has, has changed, you have to be much, much more prepared for um, so many different scenarios, so many different things. Uh, if, if you are waiting for things to happen to react, you, you can't react fast enough. So I think the, the challenge has been to be a lot more prepared, a lot more ready to, to really do a lot of war gaming, um, to, to be as um, you know, thoughtful in how you think about your year and what you're doing. Um, and to be really um, selective and uh, responsible on, you know, what you choose to really focus on. I think um, communications has uh, gotten blurred a lot with uh, social media, with digital, with marketing, with policy, with public affairs. Uh, I, I never like to fight in the sandbox over territory because I think the best and right answer is to move forward in an integrated fashion and to be a trusted advisor to your CEO, to your executive team really requires you to, to transcend functions and really focus on strategy. And that's what's critical. Do you, do you think then that some of the sort of yin and yang, the debates between marketing and PR are legitimate in some sense? Or is, the, is there a is there a seat being fought over or, or it's, it's sort of more noise, uh, you know, for people to write about than, than the reality in corporate life? You know, I have to say that really varies by industry and by company. I, I have to acknowledge in, in certain areas that the battles are very real. Um, but in other areas, I would say if communicators can be the catalyst for conversations that are different and at a higher level. Uh, you know, I find one of the really interesting things at any company that I, I've worked for um, is that sometimes the most important tasks um, people somehow feel are tactical uh, or executional and pushed down to very junior levels. So if you are in the junior levels and someone says to you, hey, will you work on our key message document? That's a huge opportunity. That is something to run to and grab because that is the most important thing that that positions a company. Um, the other thing that that I used to laugh about on the agency side is people would always come to me and say, "I hate media monitoring. I can't wait to get promoted. And when I'm not an assistant account executive, I'm never going to media monitor anymore." And I'm like, 
whoa, you guys, where do you think you get ideas from? Where do you think you understand what's happening in your industry? Where do you see what trends are? How do you find out what's going on in the world? I, I run toward media monitoring, run toward social listening, you know, run toward things that are data driven. Maybe, maybe Michael, that's something else we could talk about. There is more and more data, which allows us to be more and more targeted and more and more effective than I think you have ever been before. Yeah, I, I, I'm fascinated by that. Maybe we can build on that. I, I think I heard Catherine Blades talking recently about, um, she said the, the golden Rolodex is now becoming the golden algorithm. And, um, and she had a very interesting example that she shared about how, how uh, you know, it's being used to uh, position the company for uh, corporate social responsibility with, with essentially lots of bots running around who are picking off financial information uh, to then sort of rate you on some scale. And you're not really intervening as a PR professional or corporate comms professional to tell that story. It's just algorithms who are looking for data. And so, you know, her argument was, you know, that the, 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 the algorithms come from, you know, what, what have you seen, you know, and I imagine some of this is really even in the last five years. I mean, the role of, of data, um, measurability, analytics, et cetera. How, how do you see that influencing the field? So we've got, I think, uh, a wealth of information at our fingertips that we don't even know how to use yet. Um, if you're not involved in, in AI and using AI in communications, it's a, it's a mistake. Um, it can help us do more, better, faster, and more effectively. Um, but when I look at, at data, and, and I talk about that there's volumes of data that are available, but we don't really know how to, how to use it. Um, it's because I think communicators um, still suffer from uh, being on the hamster wheel. There are a million and one things going on in our companies. We're asked to do a million and one things. Um, in an extraordinary year like 2020, there's even more put on your plate. And it's really hard to keep churning and churning and churning and churning um, and be able to step back and really understand you know, what am I putting out that, that's effective? What's working? What's not working? How do we tweak things? Um, so you have to build into a, a process. And, and I would encourage everyone to think about 2021 as really being um, a year of, of proactively figuring out your priorities. What are the most important things for you to do? Um, I think uh, many people who grew up in the agency world, you know, learned you, you bill by the hour and um, the best way to be successful and get promoted is to write really long Q&A documents, to put out more content, to put out more press releases, to put out more material. The world is so full of information and material right now, it's a law of diminishing returns. People don't understand everything that's out there. They can't read everything that's out there. You know, in many organizations, people use the corporate communications function to look good. You know, I want a story about how my team looked terrific and accomplished this goal. But our function doesn't exist to make teams look good. Um, our function really exists to share strategy, to engage, to have dialogue. And when you talk about engagement and dialogue, those are things that we really were never able to do before. So technology now has, has really shifted uh, what um, we've been able to do. And I think in 2021, we'll continue to raise the bar on um, how we operate as, as professionals. I, I, I mean, I, th I think it's a fascinating point and also to make some distinction between the technology as a platform and the technology is sort of or the data that the platform generates. You know, you, you talked a bit there about extending the engagement and the dialogue. And I wonder maybe if we could shift a little bit, pick up on that idea. And, you know, there's been so much uh, rhetoric. We're heading into a new administration. They, they've made, you know, one of their planks or their campaign slogans is this idea of bringing America back together again. You know, we spent the last four years arguably talking about politics, arguing about politics. And I think from some previous conversations, you feel that there is, um, you know, some interest and importance about how we bring politics and or at least political and social issues into our discussions, into our discussions with our employees. And I, and I wonder if you could sort of comment a little bit about that, about you know, um, you know, how your experience with BLM or some of the fractious political issues, you know, is influenced your thinking about that, what we ought to be thinking about in, in 21 about these conversations. Yeah, definitely. I think they're going to continue to be a big part of what we 
um, have to proactively prepare for and and give thought to. You know, many companies I think felt uh, five, ten years ago uh, leave politics at the door. Uh, we are we are purple. Uh, we're not going to take a stand, and you know, employees can do what they want on their own time. Uh, I think now, um, particularly with you know millennials, they're looking for companies to um, be and live their values. And if you are leaving your values at the door at five o'clock at night, um, employees aren't really satisfied with that. So, you know, how employee resource groups um, are engaged, um, how you determine what types of things you're gonna use in policy and advocate for, all of these become much, much more important. Um, many companies made uh, very critical commitments in the wake of uh, the George Floyd uh, death. Um, a year from now, you know, in the summer, everyone's going to be looking at, did those companies make that progress? Have things really changed? You know, I think one of the other issues is, you know, many companies focused on a response for um, African Americans. You know, what about Asians? What about the, the Hispanic population? What about every other different group. So I think companies are going to have to keep this front and center um, in, in 2021. Um, and there are going to be a lot of different needs. COVID, for example, has brought forward huge disparities in health. So, you know, um, your ability to recover uh, from COVID, the health care you receive, uh, if you get COVID, what happens to you? Um, we're learning that your, your zip code um, matters more than your genetic code. So there are going to be a lot of tough, tough issues and challenges for communicators in, in 2021. And I, I want to also point out, many companies pushed back activities and critical things from 2020 because they said, we need to deal with the pandemic. So you put it into 2021. So in 2021, you're going to be doing everything that you know you, you didn't do in 2020, the things you wanted to do in 2021, you're going to be dealing with uh, vaccines, return to the workplace, all of these issues with the new administration. You're going to be dealing with all of the you know race and gender issues that we just talked about. Um, the communicator's plate is going to be overflowing. And I think unless people are really stepping back and making choices about what is the most important thing that we can do, where do we make a stand, how do we, you know, put more power and more emphasis behind the things that are important, uh, it's, it's going to be a really tough year. Perhaps, you know, maybe take us inside the boardroom a little bit and, and um, how, how do you, how do those decisions get made? I mean, how do, how do folks in your positions, council, senior business leaders about how to make those choices and pass through those choices? And, and I appreciate, I think you make a very good point that if anything, next year is going to be more complicated in some sense because commitments were made and obviously uh, you know many businesses had reasons to shift priorities because of covid appropriate so but but you know those commitments were quite public as you noted so so how do you how do you start to make those uh, trade offs so, uh, you know what what's your counsel for companies thinking about where where they place their bets and and how they align themselves so, you know, I'm a really big believer in both a robust annual strategic planning process, but I'm also a big believer in looking um, 30 and 90 days out and doing a deep dive and saying, what's happening in the environment around us? What is the most critical thing that we have to respond to? And doing a lot of data on what are your audience is hearing? What do they want to hear? What do they need to hear? What's working? What's not working? So some of those data tools that we talked about uh, earlier become absolutely critical. Uh, follow the conversation. Is this a conversation socially that you should be a part of or not? So we really try to do some analysis and look at uh, a sweet spot between what is it we want to say, um, what do our audiences want to hear about, you know, what is timely and, and newsworthy. Um, so we do our best to plan out what a year will look like. Uh, but we also spend a lot of time every 30 days saying, okay, what happened the last 30 days? What did we learn from it? How does that influence us the next 30 days? And how does it influence us the next, you know, 90 days? Um, and, you know, I think 2021 is going to be a year where you're going to have to be nimble, where you're going to have to shift uh, priorities um, and be ready for another unprecedented 
year. I think many of us are hitting the end of the year and saying, wow, I'm going to be so glad that 2020 is behind us. Uh, but get ready for a new norm. Um, 2021 is not going to be uh, an easier year. Yeah, I, I, I heard a joke going around that uh, in the future, 2020 will be seen as sort of a meme, you know, or, or people will say, how's your day? And you could say, oh, it was such a 2020, you know, and you would instantly know that just meant a lousy, a lousy day, you know. But um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm curious, though, what, where do you see some of those uh, inflection points for 2021? You know, you obviously you mentioned a, a number of items, including the availability of a vaccine and, and all of the questions. I, I imagine that's going to uh, bring up in terms of um, who gets the vaccine? How do we talk about the vaccine? Do we require the vaccine for our employees? And all these kinds yeah. of questions. Um, what, what else do you, do you see anything, um, you know, uh, from the Biden administration, you know, sort of some policy areas or anything like that you think we should be keeping an eye out for already? Well, I guess maybe let me talk at it at a, at a very high level. Um, you know, certainly there are specific things relevant to, to each industry. But what I would say is that we've never been a country so divided. And while uh, Washington is going to try to pull everyone together, I think you also need to look at your own companies and say, are, are we really united? Um, how do our employees feel? And what is it that we can do to make our purpose and our values really come alive in the most important areas? And I'll give a couple of examples on this. There are gonna be really tough decisions in 2021. More companies are gonna to have to do more layoffs. Companies are gonna to have to make really tough, difficult things that we will be called on to, uh, to communicate. And, um, you know, I think in, in traditional um, communication scenarios, we're like, you know, okay, to get the bad news out, you know, get it out quickly um, and, and move on. And maybe this is a year where we need to talk about why, and maybe we need to spend more time helping people understand the strategy, the decision-making process. Maybe we need to be more transparent and not hide behind things that, that we can't tell. I think this idea of you know, being honest and authentic with people about where a company is at uh, becomes really critical. Um, employees want to know what is happening. And um, while you may not be able to address questions uh, to people's satisfaction, I think you owe them um, the, the honesty and authenticity um, in, in a year like 2021 when people have a lot of worries and a lot of concerns. We may have lost Michael. Bonnie, would you like me to keep going on or use a chat perhaps to take some questions? Yeah, if anyone has any questions, you can go ahead and type those into the Q&A box while we uh, try to get Michael back online here. Um, if there's any other topics that you wanna elaborate on, Catherine, while we're waiting. Yeah, I um, wanted to share something. Um, I, I think as we um, all brace for a uh, professionally challenging year, um, I come from the health industry and uh, I really believe it's important that we, <coughs> excuse me, that we all take time to take care of ourselves, um, to take care of our families um, and to take a break from what's happening. Uh, I know a lot of people are burnt out after um, 2020 um, and 2021 is going to be hard. And I um, would encourage everyone to use the upcoming holiday season as a way of, you know, unplugging, of recharging and getting ready for another intense year. Um, I'm reminded of a, a conversation I had with uh, my best friend from high school. And she said to me, um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about something and do you know what the most important decision in your life is that you will ever make? And I'm like, I, I mean, I, I, I had no, no idea. And she's like, you remember in high school, we were really focused on, you know, you had to get the right grades so you could get into the right college. And then in college, 
you were focused on, you know, getting the right internship so that you could get the right job. And then you get the right first job. And it's all about I'm doing the right projects and doing the right work so that I, you know, can get the promotion. She's like, none of that matters. She's like, the single biggest decision that you will make in your life is who you marry. And I share this story with you because I have been married. Um, I, I will be 30 years next year in 2021. Um, and I, I want to say, make sure to live your life and to balance your life and, and your job, um, because I think 2021 is going to be a year where that's going to be a, a, a tough thing to manage and um, keep life in, in perspective as you go forward. Michael, good to see you back. Yes, I, uh, the, 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 Zoom, the Zoom gods were definitely not kind to me and uh, chose that moment to, to kick me out. I, um, I, won't, uh, I won't put it down to any other malevolent force other than uh, I, think, uh, I think I'd build on what you were saying about life and work balance. And uh, my computer is probably a good barometer of that. It's probably telling me uh, it's Friday, give it a rest, you know. Um, no, I, I, you know, I think, I think one of the one of the wonderful things buried in that uh, counsel uh, and wisdom for our students, uh, Catherine, is, is, is the fact that, um, you know, we probably as professionals, young emerging professionals, we've sort of probably hitting some of the most existential crises of our work lives, you know, and this is not just true for young emerging professionals, but people who've been in the industry for a while, you know, that um, everything is so upside down and, and turned around um, work-wise that, you know, I think we're searching for some things, uh, so perhaps some broader, um, you know, solid, um, reliable um, truths or relationships. And it, and it has been observed, and, you know, I'm sure you, like many of us in the industry, look at the Edelman Trust Barometer and have watched it, you know, it has been observed, and Reuters has a similar study that people are looking to companies more and more um, for, for some of that security, you know, at least they trust that relationship a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it seems to me that, um, you know, PR perhaps can play a, a role in, in how companies um, position themselves as, 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 as those trusted partners and trusted advisors and, and build trust more broadly. You know, and, and I, I wonder if you could sort of explore that a little bit. You know, I think that's probably always been the case, but uh, we don't really live in a world in which PR is seen as, um, you know, building that trusted relationship any longer. So, yeah, I, I've seen the studies and I, I think they are, are very provocative um, and give us good guidance for internal communications and, and how to think about um, how companies should in, engage with employees. Um, you know, I, I think more than ever, people feel comfortable asking tough questions and demanding more from their employer. Um, I, I think um, most companies have done a really good job um, with anti-retaliation uh, policies so that people feel that they can raise things. Um, companies who didn't do a good job have been hit with a lot of whistleblower issues. So I think those have played out very, very publicly. But when you when you have employees who who have something on their mind, you've you've got to create vehicles internally for discussion, whether it's, uh, you know, Yammer groups, whether it's live chats, um, whether it's it's town halls. And one of the things that I think communicators need to focus the most on is how do you help leaders right now? be more effective at leading and at communicating. And I think those two things are, are really related. And I, I know, David, you've asked a question here in the, the chat that I wanna respond to, which is um, leaders are really stretched. And in 2021, they will be challenged like never before. They're gonna have very ambitious agendas from a, a business standpoint that they have to meet, but they're also gonna be the middleman in you know, executing all of a company's policies on how you return to work, when you're vaccinated, all of these different components. So the more we can spend time helping leaders communicate, I think the better. Um, one of the most successful things, and I've done this at a, a number of companies, um, is tried to create um, a, a regular, uh, reliable um, communication to the top of the house that says, here are five things in the next 30 days that you need to communicate to your team and make it simple for them, distill all the key messages, the materials, the slide that they need to use in their town hall or whatever. 
but to make it really easy for leaders to be effective. Because if you're, you know, out there pumping out, you know, 12 or 13 different leader messages or constantly bombarding people with um, uh, information, um, you, you leave no way for there to be perspective or context or relevance to a department, to a team, to, to a challenge. And I think that's an area where communicators can really step up um, and where we can help companies be even more effective because leaders are going to be challenged this year um, in, in very new and different ways. Do you think the, uh, you know, I, I'm curious actually where those leaders go to for counsel these days, you know, because I, I think along, along one, one of the other things I've seen and perhaps, you know, uh, there's this phenomenon, you know, when you buy a new car, suddenly everybody seems to be driving the same car as you are. But um, uh, I, I think the same is true. It seems to me, I, I get so many thought pieces, uh, you know, white papers, strategy AI documents from, you know, in very respected sources like McKinsey and Deloitte and, and, and others, uh, agencies, you know, wh where and how are senior executives, you know, sort of passing through that content to figure out what's the value and what's, what's not. And, and, and again, is, is that a role for the PR and corporate comms functions to play perhaps in, in sort of being a, a curator or a, not, not necessarily an arbiter, but you know, I, I'm interested I, I have, whether that's yeah. a role you see. I think the word I might use is translator. Um, to answer your question, business executives are so stretched thin in this crazy environment that we're in. I don't think those thought pieces really break through um, as a communicator, um, I can only read a fraction of what is being produced. So um, if, if functionally I can't stay on top of all of it, it's, it's impossible for leaders to try to stay on top of it. What will most likely happen is some progressive person in the organization will work with some progressive communicator and they'll do whatever um, execution is innovative. So I'll throw out, um, they're going to do a podcast. And then the next thing that happens is every LT member says, wait a minute, oh, I want a podcast. Uh, just like it turned out that everybody wanted their own newsletter, their own blog, their own Yammer chat. And again, what, what's happening is you have channel, message, and content proliferation. Um, and in some areas, those can be very helpful. But if you don't watch that proliferation, it becomes overwhelm. So I'm a big believer in using technologies that help customize what people get. So as an employee, if I wanna get everything from my head of R&D, uh, from my immediate boss and from the CEO, then I wanna be able to pick, check, check, check. I want these things and they should be pushed to me. Um, you know, if you think people are gonna spend an extra hour of their day to go through your intranet site and read all of that content that we so carefully wrote, that legal so carefully reviewed, it does not happen. And if you really look at the data um, of who's consuming stories, you know, when when we dug into things and realized there were literally in some cases 30 people reading a story, we were like, it's not worth writing. It's not worth putting that content out. You know, let's instead embed more messages in, you know different ways, infographics, um, different town hall meetings, uh, and, and get everyone away from, I have to have my own special thing, uh, because it, it creates a huge burden uh, for, for communicators to try to stay on top of. Yeah, it does actually seem like there's an interesting opportunity for technology here. You know, so think about it, Kathleen, there's a concept in, in teaching and learning where you know, they argue that the best time to teach somebody something is when they need to action the information, you know, so, so the example given is you're most attentive to, um, you know, receiving directions when you need to get somewhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you really need to get to that party and you stop and you ask somebody for directions, you're going to pay attention. But if, you know, if you were told a week before, you would ignore the information. And it, it seems to me that, you know, and, and, and forgive me, I, there may be vendors out there that have such technology, but the idea that, you know, when I'm looking at the calendar, some communications vehicle pops up to say, okay, don't forget there were five messages recently about the change in the upcoming 
spring calendar or the release dates for this product or something like that, you know? So it was tying messages to other activities. So when you're, you know, signing up for benefits or something like that, you know, mm -hmm. I see you're signing up for benefits. Don't forget, you know, you got two emails recently about some change in policies. It'd be very interesting, uh, you know, I, I guess it's, you provoked a thought in my mind about how to use technology in corporate comms to, to, to put information in front of people at the time they need it, you know, as opposed to these emails that go out that, that no one reads. Yeah, there are really great platforms that now help you do that. Those are significant expenses for a company and an area where I think your team will have to coordinate very closely with IT. Um, in my experience, it's taken companies a couple of years to do that. Um, we all want things that are mobile. We're all working you know, remotely and in different ways now. So IT departments and budgets are really spread thin. Um, but I think being able to step back and prioritize, this is the functionality that's really critical for, for us and um, look at how you get that functionality either out of perhaps um, features that IT um, has already invested in, but not fully engaged um, in using. Uh, sometimes that happens, you know, IT will buy a, a platform, but not have all of the different elements um, uh, and capabilities uh, purchased. So maybe there's something there or it, whether you have to start from scratch and, you know, buy some of that technology, but it's definitely out there and very cutting edge for where our, our function needs to go. Mm -hmm. um, I throw this out because I had mentioned earlier AI. If you're in a large company, uh, I'll use um, CVS, for example, you have 300,000 employees. Imagine opening up a channel or a survey where 300,000 people can provide input. You're going to need AI to be able to scan through what are the themes, what is the tone, and what's happening. So I'm a, a huge believer, and there's some really great AI companies out there doing wonderful things. Uh, I'll go to another point. Um, you know, one of, of, of the things we talked about that's so important is how you position yourselves and what your key messages are. You know, no one really pays to monitor the competition as much as they pay for their own monitoring. Uh, there's technology that will allow you to do this. So knowing what every single company is saying about, for example, the price of drugs and medications uh, will help you understand where is your message, how bold are you, where are you differentiated and where are you the same? And literally now you have the capability for any message you put out there to compare yourself to what everyone else is saying in the industry and to make conscious decisions. I'm gonna be bolder than the average here and I'm gonna be more conservative than the average here. So that technology is, is really exciting and, and something I'd encourage folks to, uh, to explore. And, and I think you make the point implicitly, which is, that technology is used as a decision support for humans. Yes, you're, you know, it's not, it's not something that runs a mark and, and does these things itself. It's, it's rather, you know, a way by which you can get some leverage over what has become increasingly, as you said, the volume and velocity of data has just uh, shot up. So, yeah, let me give an example of that because it's one of my personal, you know, pet peeves or something that I, I always laugh about. If a leader comes to me and says, "Oh," um, you know, I, I just don't think uh, so-and-so on your team captures my voice. Um, and I, I just don't think they've, they've quite got it. I step back from that and say, okay, but let's look at all the things that they got right. You picked the right message. You picked the right channel. You picked, you know, the right vehicle. You got the right data. You got all the information. If at the end there's just tweaks to your, your voice, I'm, I'm actually okay with that. That's an acceptable edit in, in my mind. But here's what I would really love to see communicators do. And with data, you're, you're able to do that. Um, I'd love to be able to say, Michael, I'll, I'll put that in your voice and that'll be great. And you know what? You'll have 20% of people open your email. You want to put it the way I wrote it? 80% of people are going to read it. And 80% will open and act on it. What's better? Because you know what? Your voice may not be right. But if you're the leader, if you're the executive, you've been trained that your voice is right. Of course you're right. If I'm the communicator, I can prove there's a better way of doing it. And we aren't, as communicators, as focused on pulling the insights out of that data and, and, and feeding it back to executives. So being able to say to someone, you know, anything over 500 words, 
is not really going to get read in today's environment. Anything that doesn't have an action item in it isn't going to get read. So our people sometimes are so busy taking orders, um, being service providers, um, making you happy that we don't challenge ourselves to, is this the best and right thing to be done? Is this what, you know, data show our employees will really respond to or, or not? And I've seen that happen time and time again at, at leading companies. You know, people believe their, their way to be promoted is to have their business leader be really, really happy with them. Mm. Um, but the way to, to, to really be the best leader is, is not to focus on making Michael Diamond happy. It's telling Michael Diamond, what do you need to do? And what yeah. shouldn't you be doing? And I think that's where there's a great question in the chat that says, what, what skills do yeah. we need to sharpen? It's, it's that. If I'm going to be a trusted advisor, I'm going to go to you and say, here's what you need to do. And here you're full of BS if you're doing this and stay away from this. I, th I think we lose sometimes our ability to be a counselor because we are flooded with a volume of work. There's too much on our plate. We're so busy editing, cleaning up, writing, you know, churning that you don't, you don't make time to counsel and you can't right. counsel if you haven't had time to think. Yeah. And so that's where I go back to, you got to take care of, of you Give yourself time to think, give your time, self time to, to recharge and, and to reflect and to, to up your game. You know, you want to play your A game every day. And you can't do that if you're overwhelmed, exhausted and burnt out. Um, and I think we'll come back to this topic about skills, because I think there's a lot more to explore here, actually. Uh, but, you know, I, I think and I think, you know, already what you've shared, people people will take to heart so i want to encourage you uh for those on the call who want to add questions um uh there's a q a function at the bottom of the zoom screen the little overlapping speech bubbles if you want to add in questions and I'll, I'll try and uh moderate them I, I had a couple of other topics uh you know i thought uh, you know some of the students had asked previously that i wanted to get to um one is really around healthcare you know obviously it's a world you know very very well and it's a world you know, that's quite salient, uh, obviously, now, um, you know, I was quite struck, I, I, I was made aware recently of a survey, a global survey that said, you know, roughly 71 and a half percent of people uh, would would take the, uh, the vaccine if it was proven effective. But, you know, that leaves 28 percent saying, you know, that they um, would either refuse it or hesitate to take it. And that's clearly you know, of some concern from a uh, health, public health issue. And, and those numbers actually mask the fact that some countries, it was less than 50%, you know, um, some countries perhaps who, uh, where the health conditions, underlying health conditions are even worse, are more distrustful taking the vaccine. So I, I guess my question is a little bit, you know, sort of drawing on your world's working in health uh, and healthcare is, you know, what, what role do you think um, PR and comms can play in ensuring that we return, you know, both economically to an active uh, life, but also from a public health perspective? What, and what, what questions should we be grappling with? What, what are going to become the questions, you know, as the vaccines start rolling out? Sure. So let me say we've seen this story before. Um, I don't know if you'll all recall the anti-vaccine movement and particularly uh, the move to get preservatives out of um, certain vaccines um, in, in the 90s. Um, Anti-vacciners got a lot of headlines and a lot of coverage and put out a lot of misinformation, um, a lot of very compelling personal stories that really weren't based in, in science. This time around, you have even more channels, even more organized groups to put up uh, uh, resistance and, and spreading misinformation. So I, I think companies need to help be um, a source of truth and need to um, try to help employees um, sort through um, challenging issues. One of the things that I think over the last six months, anyone in the, the pharmaceutical sector became very frustrated about was the, the, politiciz the politicization of science. Um, so, you know, I think as communicators um, creating um, fact-based, data-driven information for our employees, for companies um, to use will, will be helpful. Um, keep in mind, vaccines are not perfect, and all of the vaccines that are um, being developed 
um, have some challenges, whether it's how they're administered, when they're administered, the need for booster shots. Some of these we've heard stories can be very painful and cause a, a reaction. So I think you're gonna have to help manage expectations. Um, on the flip side, there's some unbelievable science out there that's coming to the table. And for the first time in, in recent memory, uh, pharmaceutical sector has enjoyed an increase in their, in their reputation. So I think there's a lot of opportunity uh, for communicators to help um, make sense out of the nonsense and to engage rather than let all of this play out in, in public health circles. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I, I think it's quite fascinating when you dig into this topic, because my understanding, for example, is that even with the vaccine, uh, it may protect you from getting sick in the sense of needing to be hospitalized, but it doesn't actually eradicate uh, the disease from your body and you may still be a spreader of the, of, of the disease, you know? And, and so, you know, I think there's probably a very large um, job to be done, not just on the, you know, the people who discount science, the anti-vaxxer movement, but even for the folks who are, are perfectly happy to be the first in line of actually educating people what that means, because I think there's some false narrative perhaps that, you know, well, the vaccine will come, we won't have to have masks, we'll all be fine, or we go back to, but that, my understanding, again, I'm not, not a medic or whatever claim to be, but my understanding is that that, that is not true, you know, that, that we'll still have to have a certain level of, 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 of social distancing and, and these sort of other sort of mitigation policies in place for quite a while. So, um, I, uh, I think we will sort of start to pivot a little bit to some other questions. Um, I, I, I definitely, the question that's in the chat and is certainly one that's always on my mind is this idea of, uh, you know, the, the new and emerging skills. Um, you know, I sometimes frame that question uh, in a slightly narrower way, and, and I would love you perhaps to answer that, uh, which is, um, you know, what, what is it that you say to yourself gosh, I wish the universities were teaching X, you know, so when you hire people and, and you know, they're, they're obviously qualified and engaged, et cetera, but you say to yourself, God, I wish the university taught X. Why, why don't these, uh, you know, why don't these graduates know A, B, and C or know how to do A, B, and C? So are there, are there skills like that that you think we all should be doing a better job? And then more generally, you know, what do you see of some of the emerging uh, skill sets for to be successful in the next five, 10 years? So. Definitely. So I, I really wish people had more um, depth in, in data, in analytics, in being able to interpret, you know, surveys and, and pull insights from what they're seeing. Um, so for me, um, technology background, um, AI, all very, very appealing. Um, I think the critical thinking skills, though, are, are paramount. And, you know, I'm amazed at fundamentally um, at, at how poor the writing skills are still um, in many parts um, of different organizations. Um, I think people uh, sometimes get caught up in uh, very long, um, perhaps in their mind, beautifully written prose when trends are all showing short, sweet, to the point, authentic. Um, is is far more um, uh, effective. So I think those are still, you know, key skills: critical thinking, data analytics, um, technology, and and perhaps I'll use that to jump into one of the questions in the the chat, um, which says, you know, what career advice would you would you give us? You know, 2021 is going to be a really tough year in terms of the job market. Many of your major agencies are doing layoffs. Many companies are doing layoffs. Uh, you know, what what are you to do? Um, well, first of all, what I would say is um, get all the experience that you can through internships, raise your hand and volunteer for things that are important to you. Spend some time um, helping an organization. If you need ideas, I've got plenty of them that have come to me and said, can you help? We need good writers. We need good social media experts. Um, so, you know, put your skills to use now while, while you're in school. The other piece that I would say is, you know, everybody wants to go work for Disney, for Apple, for Google, um, and there are going to be a limited number of jobs. I started my career 
at a PR firm that I had never heard of and that very, very few people had ever heard of. It was a very small company and it was one of the best experiences of my life. So cast a wide net, go to some of these startups, think about some of the technology companies that are gonna be supporting communications and PR departments and look at those for possibilities in terms of first year or two. When I think about early in my career, I was really lucky to be able to try out a lot of different things, many different elements of the function to decide what I liked and what I didn't like. So for example, I was in investor relations for a while. I can tell you, I absolutely hate investor relations. Now, I like the messaging part, and I want to be in tune with what's happening with the investment community, and I think part of the strategy of understanding what the street wants is important, but do I like the day-to-day -day job that is investor relations? No, but I wouldn't know that unless I did it. So what I would encourage you to do is in your, in your 20s and early in your career, try out all the different disciplines. See if you like media or whether you hate media. See if you like the events piece, if you like internal comms, if you like CEO, leader communications. There's so many different elements and facets of what we do, social, digital. This is a, a smorgasbord. Go, go have a bite of everything, see what you like, and then build on that and get more depth you know, later in, in your career. But I think if you, if you take a broad lens to where you can apply skills in, in 2021, I think people will find um, opportunities. And, and I encourage you to be provocative. Um, you know, show me the, the skills. And this goes to agencies who write for me or companies who want to support. Did you get my email? Did you see my technology? Did you see my cool thing? I never read or have time for that. But if someone says, hey, I see you've got this challenge and I understand your biggest problem right now is this and here's a solution and what I'd be doing if I were you, I'll read that email. I'll act, I'll have that conversation. Yeah. So I think you have to stretch and push yourself to go beyond you know, the typical uh, introductory letter yeah. or cover letter or cover email. We sometimes talk at the school about do it to be it. Yeah, so the notion, uh, you know, and I had this experience when I, at one point in my career, was leading international strategy for Time Warner and people, you know, young MBAs and others would call me and say, you know, I want to be a strategist in, in, in the media industry. How do I do that? You know, how to become a strategist, you know, and I would always counsel them, you know, you don't make these kind of phone calls. What you do is you call and you say, I've been thinking about your industry and some of the really important issues in the industry. And I imagine you're really thinking about how to grow, you know, your studio business in China. And, you know, I've been thinking, you know, you, you, you act like a strategist, you know, you, you, you talk yes. like a strategist. You, you don't ask for a job and you don't, um, you know, and you don't ask them how you should get a job. You sort of, you know, you engage, you act as if you were already there is one is the counsel I often give people is, you know, imagine you're already on that team you want to work on. How would you act with your potential boss? What would you be saying to him or her, et cetera? So, so I think that's a very good, very, very good counsel. What, when you mentioned in two different places, Catherine, but I'll try and bring the threads together, a notion in a sense of sort of perspective and pulling back. Because at one point you talked about um, you know, the flood of issues that, that, that land on a CEO's desk or a CCO's desk. Um, and then more recently about, you know, in, in one's own career. Um, it does seem to me, if, if we could reflect, and maybe I'm unfair here, that that is a, the capacity to do that is a function of maturity at some level. You know, you almost need to have gone through the arc where you're hurrying and rushing and acquiring and you know, to, to sort of discover that truth that you actually need to pause. In. Are there ways to accelerate um, our understanding of that? You know, so if you are, you know, a hungry young professional who, uh, you know, is focused reasonably on how do I get a job and, you know, and is it a good job, et cetera? Is there a way, you know, you know how have you, uh, what counsel would you give to people to encourage them to start thinking about that balance or thinking about that context, et cetera? Well, I guess I come back to, you know, the comment I made about, you know, media monitoring. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing to just know what's going on in the world. It's another to really analyze what is it that um, made the reporter cover the story that way? And why did the journal write it one way? And why did the New York Times write it another way? 
And, you know, that kind of critical thinking about, you know, what's the story behind the story is something I would encourage folks to apply to their job hunt. You know, if you want to end up at an agency understanding who some of their biggest clients are, uh, what their capabilities are, what things are on those clients' minds. You know, Michael, I, I love your advice. You, you, you want to start thinking about what's driving those those companies and um, where are the opportunities to to get in and and to try something different. Um, so maybe the opening right now is in their you know social media team, but you really want to be a media pro. You know, take the job in social media, learn everything that you can, and then position and grow from there. Uh, I think this is a, a year where, um, you know, learning um, as much as you can, being um, open to possibilities and, and running to where the, the fires are um, will, will serve you well. And, and let me talk about that for a minute. Um, if you are in a company already, um, there are certain accounts um, and an agency or certain parts of the business that everybody says, oh, they are a real pain. I don't want to work with them. I've had so many people come to me and say, I don't want to work with this department anymore. They don't get communications. And I don't want to work with this client anymore. They don't get communications. I personally have found that running toward those challenges is some of the most rewarding work you can do because it, it forces you to listen and diagnose what is the problem? Why wasn't this working before? And what can I do differently? Um, so I, I think, you know, having an open mind and, and maybe running toward what others might see as unpopular um, can be very successful and very rewarding. Um, I look back on some of uh, the folks that I've worked with throughout my career and some of the bosses who had a reputation for, you know, being challenging and difficult were the ones that I learned the most from. Mm. So I would say, um, you know, 2021 is going to be one of those years. It's going to be challenging and difficult, but I also think it's going to be one of the years where we can really learn a lot and where you're going to see um, good communications separate from really great communications. Well, I, I think, frankly, that's a wonderful note to end on, Catherine. You know, I, I really do. The uh, and what could be better note for a university discussion to end on learning as, a, as an objective for 2021. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, you know, profoundly for the conversation. I, I know uh, I learned a lot from that conversation and I'm sure our students and others on the call did. And, you know, I wanna thank you on behalf of the school, uh, welcoming you back, um, you know, to the school and, um, and also our colleagues at the PR League uh, for, for joining us. And I'm, I'm sure we'll have you back soon. Um, and, you know, it's just been a tremendous delight, I think, to, 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 to listen to some of this and, and a good way to settle, I think, uh, as, the, as, the, as the end of the year approaches and the, and the new year starts. So I wanna thank you very, very much on behalf of all of us, the faculty and the administration and the students at the school. And uh, if any additional questions, uh, you know, when unanswered, um, you know, you know where to find me, certainly, and, and I can uh, parlay those on to Catherine, and um, I'm sure she'd invite you to find her on LinkedIn if you, if you, uh, if you want to be proactive and, uh, and take up some of those conversations there, so. Uh, Absolutely. Very Michael, thank you for the invitation, and I did just want to wish everyone well. Please stay safe um, and use the next few weeks um, to, uh, enjoy the holidays to, to recharge um, and to get ready for 2021. And it'll be an incredible year, but uh, delighted to uh, spend some time with you. And uh, Michael, again, thank you for, for the wonderful invitation. My pleasure. All right, folks, thanks very much.